Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Sorry that my camera is being funny. If you would like to use the chat to let us know where you are tuning in from, that's always fun. Feel free to do that if you are so inclined. I'm in Seattle. Nick is in California. So is in New York. Boston, Everett, San Antonio, Chicago, Phoenix, Connecticut, Florida. Oh, I love this. Montreal. This is so great. Oh, hi, Kate from the Pie Cottage. <laughs> London, Vancouver. Wow, you guys, thank you so much for letting us know. This is really fun. I'm going to give it just a few more seconds for people to get logged in and then we will get started. All right. Okay, that's a good number of you logged in. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle called Book Larder. It's in the Fremont neighborhood in Seattle. And um, when we are all able to travel again, and even just, <laughs> that means like across town. Um, I hope that I will see lots of you in person um, when we all kind of get out and try to see each other again. We do lots of author talks and cooking classes in our kitchen in our shop and in normal times we would of course be doing all of those in person but um, these times have offered us what I am trying to see as an opportunity to uh, take what we do to Zoom. And by doing that, reach a lot more of you and also um, get to work with all kinds of different authors and interviewers and get to do the kinds of events that we're doing tonight where we are all in different cities. And we therefore get to have like very interesting conversations um, with people from all over the place. We are of course here tonight to celebrate Nick Sharma and his fantastic new book, The Flavor Equation. It is Nick's second cookbook, and he is going to be in conversation with Sola El Whaley. She, you may know uh, from Food 52 and also from her contributions to the New York Times. They are going to talk about the book, and of course, we will leave time for your questions. So if you could please use the Q&A button that you see on the Zoom, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, it should be. If you're on an iPhone, it might be at the top. Um, if you could uh, use that button for your questions, use the chat to talk to each other if you like or to make comments, but if you have a, a question that you would like to have answered, um, please use that feature. There are lots of you logged in tonight, so we might not get to all the questions, but we'll do, we'll do our best. You can, of course, order the book. Thank you to everyone who has done that so far at booklarder.com. We have signed Nick was good enough to send us book plates. And so your book will come with a lovely sticker inside with Nick's signature. And you can support this event and support sort of our store ongoing by choosing to order the book from us. And we'd be very grateful. All right. So I'm going to turn things over now to Nick and Sola. Hello. 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 Hi, Nick. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, hello. How's it going? <laughs> I'm, good. Thank How are you? I'm great. I'm really excited because this is my first time interviewing anybody. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm the virgin sacrifice, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, it might get weird, but uh, I think it's gonna be good. Weird um, is always I, good. I'm really excited because I feel like it was just, um, just yesterday where I was reading season and sitting on my fourth client crying while eating those hazelnut cookies with the candy oh. ginger. Those are pretty fantastic. So this is awesome. Congratulations. It's Thank backwards. You. I don't know how computers work. But <laughs> it's right. I can see it right. I can read it oh, right. I, oh, great. I can't. Yeah. So <laughs> flavor equation. Um, congratulations. I was just Thank reading you. through it and it's really, really exciting. 
Um, so should we just get into it? Get, yeah. get dirty? Let's get dirty, down and dirty. Okay, okay. So this book is a big departure from season. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to like get so deep dive? Like, I feel like this is like, there's a lot going on. This is like science, emotions. <laughs> Yeah. Art. <laughs> art. Okay, I didn't think of art, but okay. Um, yeah, season was the, so when I wrote season, I wasn't sure if I would ever get a chance to write a cookbook in the first place. So that's how season came out. And at the time I said, if I get to do one cookbook, it should be about what it was to move from India to America, be gay and also be an immigrant and then come here and um, also show how experience influenced my, my experiences influenced my cooking. Um, and also kind of give an opportunity for kids who don't see themselves in, you know this, how it goes, right? Like we, you don't see a lot of kids like, well, I'm not a kid anymore, but people like us. I still feel like one on the inside. Okay, I, I, I go with that, yeah. <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to give like a voice to people that weren't getting an opportunity to talk about it. So Season is a very personal book. It's not a memoir really, it's a cookbook. Um, but I, I wanted to do that and move away from it because mm -hmm. this is who I am. You know who I am now. The second book I wanted to be about, this is what's happening in his head. It's crazy sometimes, which is true. My mother thinks I'm nuts. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, it's about being nerdy. It's about loving what I do. And I left science to get into food. And I wanted to talk about why, what drove me, what makes me love both science and cooking. Uh, and that's a culmination of everything I went to school for. Uh, and then also working in kitchens um, as I did as, at a patisserie in, when I lived in the Bay Area. And so it's a culmination of all that. And um, it's, I just want people to love science, kids who are you know, in school, uh, you know, love science because these are the things that made me excited in school. And then mm -hmm. also about cooking. And I used to do both of them at the same time as a kid. So I kind of, I hope that this book uh, makes people also uninhibited in the kitchen and realize that what we're doing often is um, something that our ancestors have been doing for so long through mm -hmm. trial and error, but there is this beautiful, a beautiful thread of science that runs through everything. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that comes across in the book. Um, and I want home cooks to feel confident because at the end of the day, I can talk a lot, but at the end of the day, I want home cooks to feel confident in the kitchen. And to me, being a better home cook was always to learn why I was doing something, why it wasn't working and why it was working. So mm -hmm. Don't cook the recipes from the book. I want you to understand what you're doing. And so you can move yeah. and take that with you. Yeah, totally. I feel like because you're telling people the why, it's like you get a deeper understanding, which helps build confidence. Right, right. But okay, I do want to go into your background a little bit. I know uh -oh. that this book's not so much about that. But it, it is really interesting. So if ev everyone doesn't know already, <laughs> you, you studied science. You're a scientist. Yeah. biology was it uh biochemistry biochemistry yeah was my major and then i moved into molecular genetics and then you went from research to working in a bakery which is a big <laughs> switch yeah. so how did you decide to make that jump because that is huge so at the i had worked at so i came to america so i studied biochemistry and microbiology in india uh, got my master's in biochemistry, came to America at Cincinnati, got a graduate degree in molecular genetics. Uh, and I actually specialized in cancer and then virology, uh, infectious diseases. And then I moved, I quit because I saw a lot of uh, research money being moved to defense at the time uh, because we were at war. Um, mm -hmm. And I was really scared of just watching my professors lose their labs. You're not, you study oh, yeah. too much and then you're not in control. And I said, I yeah. need a break from, from being uh, in academia. Uh, studying more than anything. And I'd also just come out. So I was dealing with my own demons and then also this. And so I quit my PhD program. I passed my qualifying exams. I decided to quit against everyone. My my parents were freaking out. We had a lot yeah, of I can thoughts. imagine. Family members were dialed in, just like save the day and no one, I didn't listen. And they said I would regret it. Uh, anyway, long story short, I quit and I came to Georgetown where I worked in research in at the Department of Medicine. And that was where I got my first um, experience being independent with research. And I loved it. I worked for a, 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 an MD, an MD who does a lot of uh, biomedical research. And he gave me so much freedom to create my own research studies, which I loved. And what people don't know is I was actually studying metabolic disorders at the time. 
And so I was studying uh, diabetes, uh, low sodium diets and all these things. Uh -huh. in, and so it was fascinating. And so I was connecting everything. What I missed at the time was um, what was happening with people? Because I was working in the cellular models and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. I, nothing was translating for me. And so I decided to, I was at Georgetown, I went to school uh, to study health policy at the public policy school in the evening. So I was working during the day doing that. And um, I was learning about human behavior, seeing how food policy and health were coming together and it was affecting people's behavior. And I thought that mm -hmm. was fascinating. Um, but I was in academia day and night. And so that was intense. And that's when my blog, I started my blog as a way to be creative, not knowing what- At the same time, on top of all the I need, stuff you're already- Yeah, I cannot focus <laughs> if I don't have something to do. I have a lot of, you can see on my hands, yeah, I have a lot of OCD. <laughs> uh, things have to be moving around a lot with me. Uh, anyway, so I started the blog there, Brown Table, and then from there, we moved to California, and I was doing research at a pharmaceutical company at the time, and I hated it. I really hated it. I was done. And I spoke to my husband, and I said, hey, you know what, I need, like, I really want to see if I can go to culinary school. And so I actually interviewed at a couple of places, and I saw the loan situation. I said, you know, I've never had school loans. I'm scared. I don't know if not yeah. everyone becomes successful and gets a restaurant and all that stuff. So it's, and I don't want to do that. Indian people don't like to take risk and they don't like to do loans. That's. Oh, absolutely. I right? completely agree. I only went because I got scholarships. I didn't have yeah. to take any loans out. I was very lucky, but um, yeah, I think here. that's a great choice because those loans are hard to pay back. <laughs> yeah. And at the time I read David Lebowitz's blog who I love David. And um, I, I, I love hear, it. Yeah. He wrote the all blog. of his recipes are amazing. Yeah, and so David wrote this blog post about go to culinary school or work in a kitchen and get, you know, and so I decided to follow his advice, get the experience and see if it was actually something I could do. So I worked at a patisserie called Sugar Butter Flour in Sunnyvale, um, California. Um, and then I staged, so I would lie to my job at the pharmaceutical place and said I had a family emergency for two weeks while I was staging. So I'd go early in the oh morning. My <laughs> go there, work at, uh, and stage, then go to the lab in the afternoon, but on the way, go home, take a shower so I wouldn't smell of vanilla or chocolate, and then run there. <laughs> so I did that for two weeks. On. Yeah. It was like you were cheating on your job. It was so bad. I felt, I felt a little <laughs> guilty. And then I quit, and I didn't tell them why. Anyway, I quit. And uh, I remember the place that I went to, she said, um, you sure? Because I can't pay you a lot of money. You're not going to give mm -hmm. what you were getting before. And I said, no, I really love what I'm doing. It's messy. And I'm just learning so much on the job. Mm -hmm. And I had a fabulous uh, pastry chef who um, she's of Mexican origin. Uh, and she trained me. She was the kindest person. Like I bonded with her and uh, we had a blast working. So that was, I think, one of the most formative experiences, just working and learning kind of the, you know, the tricks that you would never learn otherwise in a book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, my dogs, everyone wondering, those are my dogs barking. I keep passing them raspberries to keep them quiet, but, uh, <laughs> just, just so you guys know, was it hard to get that job, that, that yeah. first restaurant job? It was so hard. So what I did was I created a radius. I'm very, uh, if, pe if people who know me well, I believe in the <laughs> magic of spreadsheets. And so I created a spreadsheet. I can imagine. <laughs> It's uh, like your weekend activity. Where are we going to eat? Let's make a spreadsheet. Yeah, <laughs> right, that kind uh, of deal. I, I mean, I feel Excel has saved my ass many times. So I believe in the magic of Excel. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I did like a spreadsheet where I had the zip code put in and then um, made a list of all the, I wanted to do pastry at the time. So all the pastry mm -hmm. shops and restaurants that just specialized in pastry, emailed everyone, called up everyone within, I think a 15 to 25 20 mile radius of where we live mm -hmm. and no one called me up because they said because of my blog I was too experienced which was bullshit I mean I'm looking for experience to learn and then um, there was this one place and I didn't know they had two different locations which is sugar butter flour and this lady said you seem really enthusiastic to call up both places I said oh I actually didn't know that there were two different places <laughs> um, and then so she called me in for an interview and um, she was actually Persian and uh, she had bought this bakery a couple of years ago and uh, they specialized in French patisserie. And mm -hmm. uh, she gave me a chance, which for me, I feel transformed my life because it gave, showed me what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So what drew you to jump into pastry rather than savory right out of the research gigs? 
I think pastry had this kind of finesse that I, I this is, I'm going to romanticize it, which is an idiotic thing to do for anyone. <laughs> no, romanticize like, away. <laughs> I used to, with, I remember learning how to, um, you know, like make cakes at home and frost them. And it seemed like such a skillful art to be able not to get a bubble, even in a frosting around the cake. And I used to struggle. Yeah. And so I said, oh, I want to be like these people who have so much finesse and structure and they're organized. Um, it took me a while to get there when I got the job because it doesn't come overnight. And then there are lots mm -hmm. of these tricks, these tricks is, you know, you learn on the job. Um, and so uh, that is initially what drew me into pastry, but I had also been told, and this was also by the chef that I worked under, um, Alma, who told me that um, if you understand the rules, basic rules of pastry, you can translate that to savory. And she told me a lot of pastry mm -hmm. chefs will end up quitting pastry and moving to savory. And for me, in a way, pastry was a blank slate where you can learn how to develop flavors mm -hmm. and then use that to bring it into savory food. Oh, yeah, I totally agree, especially, you know, when you're dealing with all that sugar and fat yeah. and you can if you can bring like cool flavors into that, it, it, it it's a really good skill yeah. and it makes like seasoning savory food even even easier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it, it takes a lot to balance out like dessert and stuff. So you did, you've been doing that. You made it. You're, how does your family feel now? <laughs> <about your decision? laughs> uh, let's see, how do they feel now? I think they, it's a sigh of relief. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think they're almost there. I would say 80% there. Because I don't think they really what understand my life. What do you need the life. other 20, mom? <laughs> um, so my mom hasn't received the book. I haven't been able to send it to India yet. And my mom lives uh -huh. in Bombay still. And so she, I, she said, what is the weight of the book? I think they judge everything by the weight of everything, which I don't get. Oh yeah. It's I so totally, weird. Yeah, I feel like my parents are the same. Things have to be heavy and large yeah. and so, epic. So I told her, and uh, because they use the British equivalent of weights, I said, you know, mom, I think it's <laughs> about like 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms from what, it's about three, something like that. And so she goes, oh, I think that's too heavy. I don't think I can carry it everywhere with me. And I said, <laughs> I never want to ask you to do that. Just send her the PDF. She can have it in her pocket. Oh my gosh. She, uh, but the first book, I know she was really excited because she told me she went to someone's funeral with the book to show them a copy of Season. And I said, I don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> but she said, nah, no one cared. Everyone was really excited. So, I, I mean, that's how like Indian moms are. They do what they want. Yeah, I mean, they, they're not proud of you until they're very annoyingly proud of you. Right. <laughs> it becomes too much. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk more about this book. A lot of people have talked about flavor before, um, but I haven't seen an emphasis on bitter before the way that mm -hmm. you have. So can you explain to me like how you're you're going to present bitter hold on i wrote this down in a more eloquent way okay. i think that the i love bitter i think it's probably my favorite flavor but it's not really it's rarely explored in mainstream cookbooks how would you recommend a novice to start exploring bitter damn um okay it's really so bitter is one of those things which i feel is uh is the most controversial taste because yeah, as a chef you know you can't really like push it without having to say even the word bittersweet. Like when I was writing that chapter, I wanted to go online and I did this. I went to all the major cooking data, uh, cooking websites to see that had recipes. And I would type in the word bitter to see how many recipes would even show the word just bitter. Oh yeah. The number you is- You did so make a lot of spreadsheets, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, uh, there was actually a graph that didn't make it to the book where I had the different taste words that I used and in recipe databases. And it shocked me that bitter, like salt doesn't count because we use salt in everything. So mm -hmm. the algorithm doesn't really look for salt, but bitter was the one that no one wants to talk about. And then the other thing with bitter is to the people who love bitter. And then you mentioned that you have to sugarcoat it. They get so angry about that. And um, I grew up um, not liking bitter. I'm very sensitive to bitter taste. Like I can't drink, I really don't drink beer because I find it extremely bitter that I can have a couple of sips and then I, I, I make a shandy. Usually I pour lemonade in it, call it a day. I need it to be a little sweet. Mm -hmm. um, I like sweet more. Um, and then with like bitter foods, I think it was really important because it's a, it's a taste. It's a basic taste. I wanted to give it the proper 
um, attention it deserves in this book. I didn't want to like short, you know, like shortchange it just because the other ones like sweet would be better, acid would be better. Um, there's more to talk about that, but with bitter, I wanted to talk about how like the bitter plays such a like a it's a pr predominant flavor in our food so much so that breeders have been breeding plants to reduce bitterness. Uh, you know, vegetable I grew up eating in India is karela. <laughs> And like, I don't, that was my favorite as a kid. Oh, I hate it. So every meal I would have to, in order to get my mom to get me to eat anything, I'd have to have some korola and pot, and then I would eat the rest of my food. <laughs> okay, this is what I would do. I would like s slowly move it to the side. And it, it was one of those ingredients, like, you know, like a football is slowly moving on the screen. It would slowly yeah. move to the edge of the plate. Until it's just off the plate. <laughs> oh my God. Because I never, I used to argue with my parents that if you had to flavor something so intensely to avoid the bitterness, what's the point of cooking it? Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I, can, I still cannot handle it as an adult. And then I went and got tested for the gene towards bitterness, uh, pre, uh, the predisposition. Oh, cool. And it turns out I am... I have a sensitivity towards bitterness, which is why okay. I actually really struggle with a lot of bitter foods. And I, someone told me that a lot of pastry chefs actually have this, um, a lot of them will prefer sweet over bitter and it, a lot of them might test positive. It's a hypothesis. I'm not quite sure if it's true, um, but yeah. And so in this book, I wanted to give bitter a space and I wanted to talk about each chapter that it tastes looks at flavor boosters, ingredients we have commonly in a kitchen. So chocolate, for example, it's fermented, it's acidic, but it's also bitter. The, uh, mm -hmm. cocoa powder it's in the book we've got um coffee we've got um you know bitter greens um and then uh you know olive oil uh mustard oil these <laughs> are also rich in polyphenols which are bitter so i kind of wanted to bring all that together and give all these ingredients that we use every on an everyday <laughs> basis their special place in this book mm -hmm. so what do you have i know you want to treat all of your flavor babies equally because we all love our children the same right, right but do you, i'm sure you have a favorite flavor what what is your favorite flavor you mean a taste to explore? A favorite ta your favorite taste to explore uh <laughs> i would say I, <laughs> no i would say i had a lot of fun with this book exploring two of them equally because they were more experimented for me bitterness and i'm not saying that mm -hmm. because you brought it up but bitterness and also um savoriness because those were the two that i actually did experiments to get answers for which i didn't know and they show up as case studies in this cookbook um i needed to learn how to i wanted a way to be bitter olive oil and mustard oil to make emulsions and then also um you know look at umami but also do the synergy curve and that shows mm -hmm. up in one of the recipes so that was like my no emo and i'm so excited to do it for the book yeah I really like all the diagrams and stuff you have in here. The thing I found really interesting, you have like a Venn diagram of the different uh, flavors in different parts of the world. And I found it interesting that the one thing everyone agrees on is garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have I, a theory as to why? Why everyone agrees on garlic? Yeah. I think because garlic is basically found everywhere quite easily and for so many centuries. And also in, um, if you look at European cooking, you look at Asian cooking, there have been different versions of garlic or at least aliens that have existed throughout centuries. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got chives, we've got even, well, onions are a little different from garlic. Um, and I don't know if there was a book that I had to read in public policy school called Tulip. Did you, I don't know if you read this, Tulip it was about tulips being a craze in Turkey in the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so what is it called? Tulip, Tulipomania or something? Yeah, something like that. Okay, I, so I they were, remember that. for the longest time, people were also using tulip bulbs as an ingredient to cook with because they have a similar flavor profile to onions. So I think in that way, the world has been exposed to onions uh, and the alien family in general so long it's it's something that's easily adaptable um mm -hmm. and, the, and the venn diagram that you're referring to in the book um i mean i can't take credit from it it's from a research study that i came across they were doing data analytics on recipe databases and saw the way that europeans uh, prefer flavor uh, pairing ingredients with similar flavor molecules and in asia and the rest of the world pretty much no one does that and so i thought that i mean i've noticed that moving here because i had to study or not study, but I learned how to cook Indian food first. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously like I do have a lot of European influences in my cooking because my mom's going a lot of their food is Portuguese influenced. Um, so there's that European influence there, but then you come here in America and then everything is just starkly different, um, you know? Mm -hmm. And so 
it was very easy for me to make that comparison side by side. And when I saw this study, I said, it's thank God someone's done the work. I feel kind of validated. I want to put this out mm -hmm. there. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was nice to see that someone had looked at this. What was like the first big shift, like in terms of the flavor profiles um, you find more in American food? Like what was the first big thing you noticed when you moved here? There is a tendency to kind of, and you'll notice this too with restaurants, you go down the menu and you look at the name of the recipe. It, or even in cookbooks, we'll mention spices with, on the side. And then mm -hmm. we're priming people to think that they have to expect those flavors. If they don't okay. taste those flavors, they get really disappointed. So that mm -hmm. was something that struck me immediately because if you say cumin is, say it's a cucumber, cumin salad like I did in season, uh, mm -hmm. people expect a strong taste of cumin. But what if you do, if you go with an open mind and you don't want, and you don't have to experience the flavor of cumin just because you put cumin in, that's like the other hypothesis around it, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and that comes to play with seasonings like garam masala, with uh, Middle Eastern seasoning, like, um, you know, za'atar with bar barat spice, um, you know, all these different blends. Uh, and even, um, like any like mixed spice blend, shishimi togarashi, uh, look at, um, the five spice blend that's used in Asian in, uh, Chinese cooking, right? Um, depending on how people make it, they're always, everyone has their own family formulas, but no one's going in there and expecting to taste particularly one of those spices. And I think mm -hmm. the way we write recipes, that for me was like a big thing, noticing that people were expecting when they would hear something. And then often there is a tendency to say that spices make things too complicated and people want to taste the ingredients the main ingredient, so to speak. So just salt and mm -hmm. pepper is kind of uh, the baseline. I see that. I, I do agree with that. But I also feel that we need to keep an open mind because you want your food to be interesting. You know, you don't want to eat the same thing. Yeah. So I go with that where I feel that I do not have to expect a single ingredient flavor. I Maybe I'll just taste something new. And that's, uh, I think the right word for that is probably a combinatorial approach where you're tracing the flavor of everything versus just one. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. I, I, I've i noticed that as well, like with um, recipes that I've put out there, uh, if there's a spice in it, a lot of Americans want to taste the spice. Absolutely. But like, I think like traditionally in more South Asian food, it's, it's more about like the flavor combo that happens right the whole experience the you want whole every, experience you want the explosion you want everything to tingle you want things to burn sometimes you want to um taste the acid you want to taste the heat everything mm -hmm. well you know one thing i was thinking um you have your recipes organized by these different um elements of of flavor or you know experience of flavor but like a lot of things do have more than one mm -hmm happening so how did you determine like what's gonna what's gonna be yeah. the star you know <laughs> that that was the biggest challenge doing this cookbook it was never the science it was never the photography or anything it was how do i organize recipes to the hypothesis of the chapter and so in this cookbook all the recipes reside in the taste chapters and so i had to what I did was then I streamlined everything by saying, these are the flavor boosters I'm going to focus on. So if you look in the uh, chapter on acids, which is called brightness in this book, uh, we've got uh, tamarind, we've got amchur, we've got limes, we've got lemon. So then the recipes focus on that. Um, mm -hmm. You come to um, like the chapters on bitterness and then you'll see, um, uh, you know, like coffee being used with uh, the steak or, uh, and then if you move to the chapters on heat, which is not a taste, but um, we've put it under that, but you'll see like different types of chilies explored. Um, like Aleppo is one of my favorite chilies or uh, twos mm -hmm. at home uh, because it's just, there's just so much that it offers versus just red paper flakes. Um, and so you'll see those kind of elements being brought in to kind of show that, you know, this is the star ingredient here. I mean, obviously every recipe has things from all those different tastes, right? Mm -hmm. But I want you to focus on the chemistry or the like, what's happening here yeah yeah so uh how did you decide that this was going to be the the i like how you use words like hypothesis i don't even think i'm using the word hypothesis correctly but uh, how did you decide that this was going to be the focus of the book like where did you yeah how did your mind bring you here <laughs> how did my mind bring it in no one knows i don't know uh 
like for the whole book you mean like yeah yeah okay. uh, it, yeah okay Big question um i really wanted to talk about flavor as a holistic experience because that is what i was taught in school uh we were always taught uh, one of the things i learned when i worked in a lab for a very brief period of time during my rotations i worked in the lab where they looked at um uh taste channels in the on the tongue and in the body because taste rece taste receptors aren't only in the tongue as you know we're commonly taught they're also in different parts of the body because they do different things they help with digestion and uh you know Wait. influence metabolism yeah there are sweet tastes where tell me where all of the taste buds are <laughs> so i can't tell you offhand directly where they all are but for example if i remember correctly the sweet taste receptors are in our in the intestines and the stomach they help with, um diverting nutrients from the food as it's getting digested into the body uh you know there are sodium channels which are basically uh, again part of the taste receptor stuff uh, family and so all these things are all influencing taste but also other things and i think that's kind of that was something important that i wanted to recognize um and so that was the premise for this book i wanted to also talk about how emotions influence our ability to experience taste uh you know sight sound i spoke to people who had lost their vision for this cookbook to understand how they were experiencing the different senses when they cooked food and one mm -hmm. of the most phenomenal examples i can give you was uh, i spoke to this wonderful guy who told me that um when he had lost his sense of vision and he told me that warm water has a different sound it makes when rather than when tap uh, cold tap water drops and i never thought of that and i said it makes sense because the density of water changes with temperature yeah yeah but the fact that he is able because he can he's unable to use a sense of vision he is able to pick that sound up and know it how phenomenal is that's that that's so cool i right i need to pay more attention to what i'm listening to in and the then kitchen <laughs> when he said that i had already kind of made a list of cues that we were using in the kitchen you know um in india we're taught to when we do tarka we do like the wait for the mustard seeds to pop and all mm -hmm. that sizzling uh you know when um you know you can lift like fried fish off the pan because you can hear it stop that sound mm -hmm. you know a cakes do the same thing um and you can all we also judge the quality say of watermelons when we tap them so i said you know i want to talk about all of this because all of these sounds also influence how excited we get about food and also how the uh we don't get excited some of sounds turn us off so i wanted to address everything from a positive and negative aspect um as i would have been taught in school and so this book is pretty much i don't want people to feel bogged down by the science it's pretty much kind of like these are your cliff notes to moving it through the kitchen mm -hmm. science so how do you do your recipe development because i imagine you're very like formulaic there's i, I can only imagine the spreadsheets involved <laughs> uh, uh I have a master spreadsheet which no one has ever seen. Uh that's no where seen it. no one's seen. So maybe some people from Serious Eats have seen some stuff. Like probably. I bet you could just sell that spreadsheet as like a second Cookbook. you know a company that has a flavor equation. <laughs> so I have, I have, I keep a lot of spreadsheets because I constantly measure data from ingredients because I've realized over time as I cook ingredients change with places and that's not uncommon you know uh and like so one of the things where you're cooking yeah one like of the what things city you're in yeah and i i mean it makes a lot of sense because geography the soil changes if you're growing something what animals are fed is very different um and one of the most simple examples i can give you is lemon and lime juice i did the spreadsheet that i think i actually posted that publicly but um what i noticed was we I always give a volume for citric uh, for lemon juice or lime juice when I'm giving recipes mm -hmm. and people always say give us some people not all but some people will say I just tell us the amount of limes or lemons to buy from the store. Yeah. And I get it. The problem becomes when I wrote season and I did that on purpose. I gave volumes on purpose because I realized the dimensions of lemons for example come in three different sizes in the market. on average there are three <laughs> okay. different sizes and they are i'm going to say statistically significant from each other and i checked this then with a supplier and he said yes there are three different sizes of lemons that are sold in grocery stores so for me to tell someone to go buy a lemon and then they buy the large one and then they add too much acid to something that could throw yeah. an entire recipe off so i wanted to do that uh, and like um, you know make sure i want people to 
have weights, volume. So the, the, it makes you realize this is what it is. And then, you know, things like the amount of zest changes in a recipe, you know, yeah, the yeah. larger a lemon, the, the more zest. So keeping that in mind, I started to develop this database where I constantly measure things. It's, I have a little vernier cap, not a little, I have a vernier caliper that I measure the size even of beans, vegetables. With the caliper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have oh my god I really and then I calculate the t values can we turn this into a Netflix show where it's just like you coming home with your groceries packing everything with the caliper oh these green beans were four millimeters larger than the last one <laughs> I knew it and then what I do this and I used to love okay this is so sad I used to this is probably so sad I used to love doing this in when I was working in a lab because you would constantly measure uh p values and see what was statistically significant so um it helps you though, because then it gives me the confidence to make a statement versus I, one of the things I really hate doing is making a claim, which I have no statistical significance to kind of make that claim, you know, to support mm -hmm. something I'm saying. And often when, even when researching this book, a lot of claims that I had read in other books um, and that I had learned also as a child growing up with my, from my mom and grandmother, a lot of those things didn't hold true when I was testing things for this book. Ooh, give me some examples. Uh, uh, roti. Okay. Um, so what I learned was, um, so in India we get atta, and then in yeah. America we get all-purpose flour, and you know this too, that they come from two different types of wheat. Uh, They're totally India, different. Right? Yeah. And in India it's hard wheat, and then you're in America, it's soft wheat. Um, the problem was every Indian cookbook that I read would say, do the like half and half, and it works. So you, what they Wait, were saying. Wait, half and half atta and uh, uh, No, they would say, <laughs> If you don't get atta, if you don't want to buy atta, take one cup all purpose, take one cup of regular wheat flour, mix it together. Yeah, whatever. yeah, that's what my um, mom does too. It never worked for me. <laughs> and so, and I tried multiple ratios. I bought four different brands of flour, you know, went through it, this whole situation. And then I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to PubMed or Google Scholar and then find out what do people know? Why am I wasting my time? And it turned out that the reason why they're called hard and soft wheat actually is quite indicative of what's happening. In hard wheat basically refers to the strength of the chemical bond between the protein and the starch. Um, and that bond is so hard, it's so strong that you need so much force or energy to smash it. And that's what's okay. happening during milling. And because you're grinding it so much to break it down to an appropriate size of a flour um, that works for you, you get this value called the damaged starch value. Hard wheat or atta has a higher damaged starch value for that very reason. So if you look, I mean, I don't want to cross these up. I usually get confused with um, like very like two variables always left and right. I make this, I'm always bad about that. Um, much to my husband's vexation. I can never tell left or right sometimes. <laughs> um, but soft wheat, the energy required to break that bond is not that strong because mm -hmm. they're not that tightly bound in the, in the grain, the starch granule and the proteins. And so it breaks quite easily. And so you have a lower degree of a starch value. And I called up King Arthur Flower and asked them about it. And they said, yeah, the numbers are different. Let me give it to you. So I got the numbers from oh, King Arthur Flower, wow. put them in That's the book. Awesome. And then, so it turned out that basically all the flower scientists who work on the cereal knew this. And even the scientists in India, and they were also using the, that information for more than 20 years to make commercial chapatis in India, because a lot of people in India also believe in convenience food and I get that because you know, families are working. So how do you make food accessible uh, and just warm it up and you get the same texture? So that's what I did then. I couldn't change damage starch values. What I did was I compared the elasticity of the dough of atta after kneading to different ratios of all purpose and whole wheat flour. And finally, when I got what I thought was right, I said, okay, this is the amount. And that changed the game for me because I don't always have atta at home. Um, you know, sometimes I buy atta and it's not the best quality. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, it always varies. Sometimes, sometimes it's sitting on the counter for so long. And so yeah. this changed the game for me. So I put it in the book. So if people who want to try to make flat bread without having to go to the store, they can learn how to make Indian bread, but just using more things that you already have at home. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pick up the dog. Okay. It's the best way to shut her up. <laughs> come here. Come here. She, you know, this is great. We'll have an extra, we'll have an extra guest with us. 
but oh now God, her I love snorting... those grunting sounds. Oh my god! Yeah, there's a lot of grunting. She's a loud one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so that explains a lot. I've I've noticed that a lot of times, like the hydration is totally different. Mm -hmm. So do you do you have a specific AP flower that you like to use? Because I know that King Arthur is so different from like gold medal. Mm -hmm. Like they're almost, I, I think it's crazy to even call them both AP. Yeah, so what I did was I used flowers that I knew would be available either here or in other countries. Just to, or at least had similar damage starch values. So that's what I did. I found out uh, what were comparable damage starch values and then went with that as my guide. Because at the end of the day, I want everybody, not just like, you know, not just people who are in America that live with, you know, in the same country as me cooking. I want everybody to like cook these recipes mm -hmm. as an author. That's what you want at the end of the day. And so in order to make it accessible, I did a lot of research asking people uh, like my friend Ed Kimbo, who writes uh, The Boy Who Bakes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I reached out to him and he's been wonderful with like my UK like research. It's been amazing. <laughs> and so I ask him questions and then also like other authors out there. And then even in India, I'll ask people questions. And they come back and get me all the information that I, I contact companies too. The, uh, and sometimes they're very responsive. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's like a lot of research that goes into uh, kind of standardizing something, as you know, for this, because mm -hmm. it's, a li it's a little more intense because I want everyone to have a chance to make it and hopefully enjoy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I love so that. crazy to say. <laughs> you know, some of my favorite recipes of yours are like, um, a lot of the the Indian food that you've done, like your puris, are like the best. Oh, really? Okay. I like they puff every time, which is oh. really fun. And the gulab jamun is like awesome. And like for me, I I find it really hard to develop recipes like that I've grown up eating because there's like the the memory that I feel like is really hard to recreate. So was there one like that 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 was really hard for you to like get that full memory? <laughs> Uh, good question. I think one of the recipes I purposely not tried to learn how to make is Ras Malai because I am a demon when it comes to Ras Malai. It's the only Indian dessert that I love to death. And uh -huh. I usually buy a container from the Indian store sometimes and I hide it so no one else knows. I mean, it's only my husband and me, but like, I hide <laughs> it so he doesn't know. Yeah. And then I devour it. And so I purposely made it a goal to not learn how to make the recipe because I know then it's a disaster. Gulab jamun. You just can't be trusted around it. Yeah, so it's it's not worth the disaster. And I've tried to justify this quite a bit by saying it's like a protein on protein kind of thing because it's milk proteins concentrated to form the solids and then you've got milk protein yeah, that it's sitting. Yeah, it's like practically a smoothie. It's like healthy. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my so my mother says, no, you need to stop. So I've kind of like in my adulthood, I'm trying to be better, a better child uh, to her. But I purposely tried not to learn it because I know I will devour it as soon as it comes off. In terms mm -hmm. of recipes that I've tried to recreate that have been hard to do because of memories, I would say a lot of the go on recipes that I grew up eating, one of the things that I've um, tried to do, but it's a lot of work and it, it's delicious. It's the bibinka and it's not the bibinka in season that's a different kind of bibinka it's the bibinka where you layer and you bake you layer and you bake and there's a distinct aroma a distinct uh texture to it that i have struggled and i've inherited my grandmother's cookbook and she has four different recipes i just haven't had the time to kind of sit down and mm -hmm. do it um but again i think that's one of those things that i really love and once i learn how to do it it's again like a disaster for me yeah <laughs> So what's the thing that you probably make the most? Like what's your favorite one that you can't stop eating that's almost a disaster for you? Uh, ice cream. I learned how ice to cream. make- Ice cream. Ice cream is my, uh, uh, everything's sweet. So you can see like I have a sweet theme in my life. Um, I love lemon ice cream, anything really tart. So lemon, uh, passion fruit, ice cream. Um, and I grow my own. So what I try to do is- Do you grow your own passion fruit? Yeah. So when I moved from Oakland to I didn't know you LA, could even do that. Yes. If you move, move here, you could do that. You can grow it on the East Coast. And I remember living in DC, we did, but it it's deciduous. It dies and comes back. But here it's a perennial. Uh, but yeah, when we had one in Oakland that I planted and it 
grows really fast, took over the entire wall. We had so much fruit that when we drove, I cut all the fruit because I didn't want to get the new buyers of the house, the fruit. So packed it up in a box <laughs> and it ripens off the vine. So we had this big box of, I think like 60 or a hundred. I gave some to some friend, like a four to like a couple of people, but not more than that. Uh, and yeah, I drove I've it from only, the and off the fruit. I've only used the, the passion fruit like puree. That's, that's comes, what I used to you use. You know, the frozen a, yeah, one? Yeah, the French one, right? So does this, does, when you're using fresh, is it, are you just like scooping and smushing it through a sieve? Is it a lot of work to get that pulp? Um, it's, so I use a trick that I learned from Nigella and she puts it, she takes the, scoops out the pulp with the seeds, pops it into a blender and presses it for a couple of seconds on high speeds just to break everything. And then mm -hmm. you pour it through a sieve and it all comes out. And so you get the oh. liquid. You can eat the seeds, but then you throw the seeds out. Oh, that's great. Do, so do you see your husband cook too? He barbecues. Do you guys ever cook together? Do you have like a favorite meal you make together? <laughs> Are you separate? Do you keep it separate? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bar bar like barbecue is this thing. So yeah, I mean, I come and watch, but I don't want to get too involved in his cooking because then it becomes, I think it, it, I think it's a little harder for him to be married to someone who cooks. Um, I, so I think sometimes he might feel judged. So I kind of like stay away, let him do what he's doing. Because also I don't want to cook all the time. I'm cooking for work all the time. So it's kind of yeah. nice for me to get that break. I don't want to like, unless it's something like, he'll ask me a couple of times, do you think it's ready to move it off? And you know, from the stove. So yeah. Well, it's great because he's got his space outside. You have your space inside. Right. So you, there's no, there's no fighting. Yeah, okay. marriage is compromise. I have another question. Okay, so what was the most surprising discovery you came across when you were researching this book? Mustard oil. I've been a big mustard proponent. oil. I've been a big proponent of pushing mustard oil in America. I've written about it at Serious Eats. And then I also mm -hmm. recently uh, wrote something, made the mayonnaise, which is in the book, the curry leaf mayonnaise. Uh, a reason also why I wanted to do this book was I wanted to write about food science, but from um, kind of put the European uh, focus that has predominantly been on food science aside and focus on it from an Asian perspective, because that's what I'm most familiar with. When I went to school in India, those are the examples that my, my professors taught me. Uh, from fermentation, like we used to take dosa batter and then, you know, gram stain it under the microscope and look at the yeast and bacteria um, yeah. or kombucha and all those kind of things, because those come from that other part of the world. Um, and so the most fascinating thing was I wanted to make a mustard oil mayonnaise for this book. Hardcore, like I wanted the I'm pungency. I'm get the other dog, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. The other one is barking now too, but. They're like little kids. But we're going to trade. Continue. <laughs> oh. Hi. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. I got distracted by the dog. Um, <laughs> sorry. So I really wanted to make a mustard oil mayonnaise. And so I wanted the pungency that, the, you know, the wasabi flavor that comes from mustard oil. Um, and I think mm -hmm. it's such a phenomenal oil for someone who, want, who loves that, you know, that heat that comes from wasabi. That's the oil for you. Um, it's also a good oil because it has a high smoke point you know, used in Bengali, Bangladeshi cooking quite a bit. Uh, Guru goes great with seafood. And so I decided to make this mayonnaise with mustard oil and it tasted bitter. And I knew that all in the past when I've made olive oil mayonnaise, it's well known that it tastes bitter because of polyphenols, yeah. right? And when I went back to the research, did my research and ran experiments, I found that I could de-bitter olive oil by just basically washing it with boiling water and then using that oil uh, to uh, make mayonnaise because polyphenols dissolve in boiling water the best rather than tap water or cold water. <laughs> and said, why not repeat this experiment with mustard oil because it's showing the same phenomenon and there's not a lot of research done with mustard oil. Again, because it's an ingredient that's used in Asian cooking yeah. and no one has really invested the time. And so I felt I'm noticing this phenomenon of bitterness in emulsions again with this another <laughs> oil. Um, repeat the experiment with the boiling water and cold water. Lo and behold, same phenomenon. And I went through the literature trying to find out what were the chemicals and I couldn't find anything which threw me off. And so my hypothesis is that it's basically again polyphenols and they're highly water soluble in boiling water. Method works, it's replicable. So 
this is something to me that was really exciting to do something new and put it out there in the world. I didn't even know that it had a high smoke point until I read your Serious Eats article, and now I'm cooking in it. Ah, oh, that's what we used I got it in the India. brand you told me to get too. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> it's really good. So, do, should we take some um, audience questions? Yeah, I see. There's a few here. Yes. So um, Lars would like to know. Um, he says his wife already thinks he has too many cookbooks. What <laughs> tell her different, differentiates your books from some of the other sort of sciency books out there? Wow, putting you on the spot, huh? It's your book, Nick. All right. So I'm, all I'm going to say is about this book is that it's what you need to know in terms of science. It's not long essays on science, but it's science told through story and a practical approach. So when you're in the kitchen, you know what's happening. At the same time, it's experimental. So you feel like the recipes are teaching you things. I didn't want this book to be like an old story because I've studied a lot of science in school. It's fun to me, but theory is not always fun for everyone. It should feel practical, right? That's what draws you in. So in that sense, it's a practical science cookbook. So you feel like you're learning as you go. And honestly, how many other science-based cookbooks have actually focused on Asian food? So this might be the first one, right? I, I mean, I would like to. At least in America, I would like to think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not aware of another one in America, at least. So, but I certainly don't know all the books. Um, <laughs> so, Karen would like to know when you're putting recipes together into a meal, okay. do you have a formula for how you build the meal with flavors? That's a very good question. So, what I actually do is first of all, see how heavy the main ingredients in the meals are. So if all, you don't want a meal to feel heavy throughout. Uh, and sometimes often like, a, like if I'm making chicken biryani or mutton biryani or lamb biryani, that's quite a heavy meal. It's quite rich. And so then my dessert to the end of the meal has to be really light. The sides that go with that have to be really light. So I usually go with, you know, like a raita, which is traditionally what's served with it or some kind of salad, maybe a spot of achar, which is a pickle. Um, not too much because it's so heavy. So that's one thing judged by the heaviness of the meal, what kind of ingredients you're using, like starches will weigh you down, proteins tend to weigh you down quite a bit. Um, keep that in mind. And then in terms of flavor, I encourage people because this is how I grew up. It's okay to have a table with meals, you know, from different countries. Why not? Why the hell not do it? Because that's how my parents cooked. Um, and that's what drove me to be experimental and adventurous in the kitchen because I didn't grow up with this notion of it has to be North Indian food today. It has to be Goan food today. Um, and I feel I've never had to think about that. So I don't think about that. So often at home, if I'm cooking, my husband's from the South, he's from Virginia. And I will make, um, like we'll do fried chicken sometimes. We both love fried food. And so we make fried chicken sometimes. And then so with, with um, rice, um, the, I, I usually do like a chicken rice that's boiled in chicken stock uh, for more flavor. And then uh, we'll serve it with some kind of chutney or like a raita. So you can mix and match things from different parts of the world. I would say do it because it makes for a much more adventurous time. You learn more, get to experience food from different places. All right. Um, there is another question. Oops, I lost my little... Um, we've got quite a few questions that aren't necessarily directly related to the book, but here's, well, actually, I guess this one is because you shot all the photos. So um, what is your best advice for amateur food photographers? Taking nice photos of dishes I've made is not easy, says Jason. Okay. I will give you advice that my dad gave me. So my dad is retired now, but he uh, was an he was a fine arts student and was an artist and then moved into photography to survive because artists, he said, don't make money. Anyway, uh, yes. so my dad told me with photography, practice before you shoot. Because don't be, uh, he said, like, it really doesn't matter on the brand of the camera. I use Nikon only because my dad used Nikon cameras. It's not because I think Nikon is superior to Canon or Sony. Uh, it's because of that kind of like family thing that I know it's a trustworthy brand with him. They're all good at the end of the day because I've tried them all. Um, but practice more than anything, practice, understand why light works and why, why light doesn't work. Look at to your, you know, look at styling, read before you kind of get uh, trigger hungry, so to speak, because that's how I learn. And then when you get your photos, critique the hell out of them. I'm very self-critical. 
Um, I like for this book, I think I had a total of 3000 photos that I took and then I, we culled it down. I culled it down before it goes to the designer. Designer, she picked a lot of stuff. And then I went through that. And again, I said, okay, I don't like this. Let's move this out. And then this book also has microscope photos, which was something that I really wanted to like squeeze in. So, because that's the first microscope, uh, the first camera that I learned to use was actually a microscope camera. And I went to UC Berkeley, got photographs of a lot of ingredients, um, a lot of Indian ingredients too, that I've never, I had never seen photos of. So they're in the book. But practice, more than anything, practice before you shoot. Uh, Brigitte or Bridget um, wants you to pick your favorite child. Do you have a favorite recipe from the flavor equation? Um, but she would also like to know if you if there's a particular sort of beh beside, behind the scenes story about it that makes it special or a favorite. Ah, oh, God, oh, behind the scenes story. Uh, damn, that's a really tough one. Okay, so favorite recipes, you're right. It's like picking a child, but if I had to push someone in a direction, I would say the date, uh, the date, the, what is it? What is it? What is, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it. The gingerbread cake. Make the gingerbread cake because uh, for me, when I first visited LA, we went to Jelena and that cake is kind of dedicated to Jelena. Um, also one of the a cookbook that I really love and they do this date, uh, this gingerbread cake, which is served with uh, kind of similar ingredients. And so it's kind of my tribute to Jelena and um, I use date syrup. And when I was making date syrup for the cookbook, I actually ended up calling 911 because my neighbor told me another neighbor's house was getting burgled to call 911. And so that for me has like a backstory that I kind of, it's somewhere mentioned in the book about him, I think in the emotions chapter um, but yeah, 911 date syrup is my association. And then because I really love gingerbread cake. So this was kind of my tribute and it has whiskey in the, I mean, bourbon in the sauce. So this is the weather for it. All right. We have time for a couple more questions. And this is one that I always like to ask too. So I'm going to okay. go with Emily's question here. What are some of the essential reads other than your own, of course, um, that you would say helped form the way that you cook? essential reads. Okay, so cookbooks, the, I call them the holy trinity of England. Um, Nigella Lawson, Nigel Slater, and Diana Henry. <laughs> Those three authors are phenomenal people in any way, and they've been really supportive in my career, but I have read their books through and through uh, where I have learned better recipe writing through the way they talk and write their recipes. Uh, there's a practicality, you know, an approach as a recipe writer. I don't want, I don't have a team of chefs myself working behind me. I clean my own dishes, which is quite frustrating um, after I cook. And so I have, I'm, I really try to bring that into my recipes. Often a recipe sounds very beautiful and grand. When it comes down to performing it in the kitchen, sometimes I go, oh my gosh, I can't expect someone to do this when I hate doing it even though it tastes good. So I actually chop those out or I try to make it easier. So that's something I've learned from them. And then other cookbooks definitely recommend Samin's book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, or which is um, gives you again, like, a, like the whole background of what's happening in the kitchen. And she does, she's a beautiful communicator at that. And um, another book that I will recommend, I'm gonna take a look because my Asian cookbooks are on the side here. It's um, Phoenix, Claus and Jade Tree which came out uh, several years ago. And it's by my friend, uh, Ko Ken Liam, who wrote um, this Chinese cookbook that I love because he is a phenomenal teacher of Chinese cooking in New York and then brings those approaches into that book. And I learned so much, for example, Shazuan peppercorns, you don't always have to like smash them and do all that stuff and toast them and all. He does it so beautifully, treats ingredients gently. There's a playfulness to it. And so read books from different cultures because they will make you a better cook at your own culture, you know, at your own techniques, what you've been learning. Yeah. All right. And one last question from Leah and I, um, you dedicated your book, your book to Floyd Cardoz. And so she would like to uh, know if you could comment on how he influenced you and what he meant to you. So Floyd and I have a very funny, amusing history. Uh, we met for the first time in Paris on a press trip. Uh, we were both going to uh, the stove factory and we were both on this trip. And we both, funny enough, brought our cookbooks in our bags to give each other quietly. And my book hadn't come out then. So I had like this copy for Floyd, you know, with a uh, season with me. And so we were in Paris. And while we were talking, this was the most bizarre thing. Not only were like, 
we both shared the same community, like we're both going uh, from the same community. We're from the same city. We're from the same suburb in the same city. Then it turned out uh, families kind of know each other where my mother knew his mother. And that's how it is in India. Everybody knows each other. And so then I called my mom up and I told her and she said, yeah, so like, haven't I told you this before about the famous go and I said, no. And she said, that's because you don't like pay attention to me. So we had this immediate bond and Floyd was very kind, um, kind of, uh, he was funny. Like, he had a, like when I went with him on the table, like a lot of the dad jokes and everything. So, you know, he just, there was just so much fun. And then my uncles went to school with him. So I was talking to my, my mom's family now lives in New Zealand. So I'm talking to them saying, my uncle said, yeah. So I knew Floyd and his brothers like, because we all went to the same school. We were in the same class. And so there was this family history that I didn't know about. Um, and so he meant a lot to me because he's the only chef that I knew that put Go and Cuisine on the map globally. And like losing his loss, I think is, is a big hit to the food industry and also to the cooking community. Um, you know, Flavor Walla was such an important contribution to cookbooks. And so it's, I felt it was important for me to acknowledge this man for his work because he gave me confidence to put my work out there. Yeah, that's lovely. Sola, did you have anything else? Oh, this was really fun conversation. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And yes. uh, I'm sorry about all the barking. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. It was fun to have them join us. I took a couple screenshots, so, you know, oh, wow. I'll make sure I post those afterwards. Yeah, I love pets anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Nick, and congratulations. Thank, thank you, Sola, for your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Again, the book is available at booklarder.com. <laughs> The flavor equation. There it is. It's so gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Everyone hold it up. There we go. Yay. Oh, mine's Thanks backwards so. though. Oh yeah. See, mine's backwards, but yours aren't. That's interesting. Oh. Anyway, um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening and um, happy cooking. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.